welcome everyone to the this meeting is being recorded thanks for coming uh in the midst of all this weird uh uncertainty thanks for showing up anyway <sighs> okay <laughs> thanks for coming to the sujimoto lecture um quick um stuff that we're going to talk about logistically if you have any questions please put them in the chat and we'll read them in the order that they were submitted at the end of the lecture. Um, and Tim, don't worry about monitoring the chat. We've got that. So just some uh, background on why we do the Sujimoto lecture. Uh, the Sujimoto lecture honors Harry Sujimoto, an accomplished former Berkeley staff member. After completing his undergraduate work at Cornell University, Sujimoto obtained a master's in plant nutrition from UC Berkeley with Daniel Arnon as his thesis advisor. He spent the subsequent 30 years as a member of the Arnon Research Group, where he participated in major discoveries on photophosphorylation and ferrodoxin. After his retirement, Harry and his wife, Grace Case, established the KT Foundation, which set up an endowment in our department to support the annual Sujimoto and Buchanan lectures. Harry said that he felt grateful to have had the opportunity to work for the university over such a long and rewarding career, and he wanted to give something back to the place that supported him. The PMB graduate students select the speaker, a recognized individual in plant biology or microbial biology each year for this lecture. So on behalf of the PMB graduate students, I'm delighted to present Dr. Tim Vanapainen as our 2020 Sujimoto lecturer. Although we're very disappointed he couldn't be here in person, we're so excited to hear about his group's work in today's seminar. So now I'm gonna give you a little background on Tim. Dr. Tim Vanapainen earned both his bachelor's and master's degrees in evolutionary and population genetics from the University of Amsterdam and earned his PhD in virology and theoretical population genetics from the University of Amsterdam Medical School. Some fun quick facts because we all need some fun today. As a teenager, he was a skier on the Dutch youth national team. As an undergrad, he was a waiter and a bartender in Amsterdam. And during his PhD, he was a ski instructor in Austria and a sailing national champion in the Netherlands. In contrast, I'm also doing my PhD and just figuring out the ins and outs of EndNote. He's currently a principal investigator of the Van Apinen Lab at Boston College, which develops experimental and computational systems biology tools to study infectious diseases as a complete system while in interaction with their environment with the ultimate goal being the development of approaches to predict and, in, and detect the emergence of drug-resistant infectious diseases and strategies to eradicate them. In addition, Dr. Vanapainen serves as the program director of the NIH Center on Systems Biology of Infectious Diseases and Antibiotic Resistance. He's founder of the Boston College Bioinformatics and Sequencing Corps, and author and editor-in-chief of a science and society book aimed at the general public in collaboration with the brightest thinkers, authors, scientists, and entrepreneurs in the Netherlands. So if you'll all join me with your clapping emojis, we're so excited to hear from Dr. Van Apinen. So please join me in extending a warm welcome via the Zoom applause react emoji. Tim? All right, all right, all right. Thank you. Um share my screen PowerPoint all right can you see my screen yes yes awesome okay great thanks Christine <laughs> that's great for the introduction and Thank you all for inviting me and having me. This is really exciting. Even though I have to be here and not over there, this is really great. Um, so for this special Tsujimoto special lecture, I will be talking about several topics that are all focused on infectious diseases and the work that we're doing to try to make predictions on their behavior, identify them and track and target them. But I'll first basically set the stage with the challenges that we're dealing with in infectious diseases and introduce the challenges my lab works on. While today we may use all kinds of fancy experimental and computational approaches, the greatest achievements concerning the control and protection against infectious diseases 
have really been made with the improvement of basic hygiene, invention of vaccines, and of course, uh, the discovery of antibiotics and antimicrobials. Gradually, it seems we have started to take many of these advances for granted. And while, the, and, and while at times it may have seen we had it all under control, it turned out that the microbial pathogens persistently evolved new ways to evade the drugs and vaccines designed to target them. While new infectious agents get introduced into the human population through zoonotic events, like one of those events we're living through right now. And I think that to effectively combat this interconnected threat of infectious diseases, their spread, transmission, and drug resistance, it is really important to realize that human, animal, plant, and environmental health are, are all intertwined. And the CDC has actually defined this interconnectedness as one health, which means that to find sustainable solutions, we should consider all the aspects of this challenge as an integrated problem. So importantly, I think that such a com complex challenge can only be efficiently solved by taking an interdisciplinary, translational and collaborative approach. Now, there are at least five key problems in infectious diseases that we need to address and solve. And in my lab, we work on the first three. So we need to understand how drug resistant infectious diseases emerge, evolve and spread. We need to develop and implement new rapid diagnostics. And we need to develop diagnostics in for treatment strategies as well as new drugs. So in my lab, we aim to develop approaches to detect and predict infectious disease progression, the emergence of drug resistance and strategies to resolve them like Christine already said. And, and that's depicted sort of in this, in this uh, slide here. And for this, we employ a mixture of tools and ideas from the fields of biology, chemistry, physics, and computer science. And like I said, our projects fall within the first three called key one health problems. And in the next 50 minutes or so, I will tackle uh, uh, several examples for each of those. I'm gonna do the following. I will highlight work that falls in key challenge one, which addresses why we think understanding how drug resistance evolves is really key and how we may be able to monitor, predict, and prevent it. I will highlight two pieces of work that fall in key challenges two and three, which have to do with diagnostics development for species and drug resistance detection, and how we are trying to build models that can make predictions on adaptive evolution and disease progression. But I'll start with tool development as it really fuels a lot of the research we perform in the lab. And, and first off, a tool I can't ignore, um, of course, is, is TNC or transposon insertion sequencing, which I developed in the bacterium Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, when I was a postdoc in the lab of Andy Camilli at Tufts. However, back then, for me, working on bacteria was really something very new and felt exotic because before joining Tufts, I obtained my PhD in 2006 from the University of Amsterdam on experimental and computational research on the evolution of HIV-1, a virus, which is very different from a bacterium, right? So now in now Amsterdam, I have to tell you something about Amsterdam. Amsterdam is really an amazing place to live. It's extremely international and there's always something to do. Now, I personally can get easily distracted. And while my PhD work was very exciting, I also was very excited by many other things, but I'll, I'll actually only tell you something about a, a couple of science and society related things I worked on while doing my PhD. So back then as a PhD student, I always got a little bit upset when some kind of old scientist was in the news to talk about some new discovery. While I knew that, the, that we, the, we, we, back then we, we the grad students did all the heavy lifting. This actually motivated me to do stuff in science popularization with a bunch of my grad student friends. So I wrote my first book uh, during my PhD and I founded the Dutch Annual Science Night, which was an amazing party with science, art and music for the lay public in the center of Amsterdam that would start at 7 p.m. in the evening and would end at 7 a.m. in the morning in an enormous uh, uh, dance party. And, and that, that party ran for a decade. And uh, at the same time, I also started a popular science blog in Dutch. And today, I guess I'm, I'm an older scientist now, but I'm, but I'm still involved and I compile a science and society related book almost every year. And I really believe doing these kinds of things is very important. And I'll get back to the why at the end of the talk. Okay, 
back to the science. So I got my PhD on HIV-1, but as a postdoc, I wanted to make a switch and I was drawn to the networks that were being built for organisms like yeast. However, I wanted to keep on working on, working on infectious diseases and thought that bacterial pathogens could be the most interesting to make these networks for. Now, in reality, what I wanted and what I still want to do is build digital twins for pathogens, like what GE does for their airplane engines and turbines, in which they monitor every inch of their engines to make predictions on their behavior. In that sense, we want to monitor every inch of the pathogens we work on to predict what they're gonna do next. Right? So, so I started as a postdoc and quickly realized that I needed to develop new tools in order to build such networks. Now, while developing TNSeq, two important things happened, which is that my now bestest friends, Mara and Kim joined the Camille lab and Kim, whom you may all know better as Professor Seed in your department, uh, and who told me actually last week she was not gonna be in the audience today, which is great because that means I can tell you a funny story about her. Um, now, the last time we met in person was about 10 months ago during Christmas and, and, and New Year's in my house in Vermont. And, and I recommend you ask her about the haunted house experience she had there. However, I'll share a different quick story about Kim. Coincidentally, Mara was actually uh, Christine's PI in undergrad, small world, right? So Mara, Kim and I ended up in the same bay in the Camille lab and became really close. And at one point, Kim went to Bangladesh to collect vibrios. And by the end of her trip, she had also managed to personally catch some of those bugs and had become sick. Now, luckily she soon came home and quickly recovered and planned to return to the lab. But Mara and I, as her besties, we didn't want to take any risk. So Mara and I started the Kim's first responders team and built her a containment facility in our bay complete with air filtration system to keep her isolated from us. And needless to say, she really, uh, uh, really loved that situation uh, where she had to work in our own uh, uh, containment facility. Anyway, we were talking about TNC, right? If you don't know what TNC is, the thing you want to understand is that it is based on an age old philosophy. You break something and you see what happens, right? So this of course works really great in biological research. For instance, you knock out a gene and you see if you get a phenotype. Now with TNC, by using a transposon that jumps randomly into a bacterial genome, you can determine which genes are essential and you can very accurately measure the fitness contribution of each non-essential gene in the genome, simply by determining the frequency change of each transposon mutant in the population through Illumina short read sequencing. You can thus very quickly get a genome-wide view of the importance of each gene in the genome in a specific condition. And over the years, we have really used this approach in a whole bunch of projects to answer all kinds of different questions. Now, of course, TNSeq and similar approaches are, are amazing. However, we've always ignored at least one shortcoming of the approach, which is that uh, we grow all of these mutants together in a pool. And we basically ignore the fact that some mutants may be influencing each other. For instance, they may be helping each other out by providing resources that others may miss because of that transposon insertion, that mutation in the genome. Now, in order to get a handle on that, we recently combined TNSeq with microfluidics designing droplet TNSeq. And in, and in droplet TNSeq or DTNSeq, we encapsulate each mutant in its own isolated single growth compartment consisting of a small droplet, somewhere around uh, 40 to 65 microns large. And these droplets are very rapidly produced on microfluidics chips we built in our clean room. So within about 15 minutes, we can encapsulate millions of single cells and mutants into droplets, right? And these droplets consist of an oil outer layer and the inside of the droplet is filled with growth medium, enabling the bacteria to grow and multiply. This means we can perform TNC on each mutant in the population while culturing them in isolation. However, after growth, we simply pull them back together and perform TNC sample prep, which retains basically, and, and because we can do this, this, the same sample prep, this retains the high throughput nature of the approach. And through this, we have found that about two to 5% of mutants have a very different phenotype in a pool versus when they are growing in isolation. And this information we've been able to exploit to connect new phenotypes to genes. And most recently, we've done this in collaboration with Matt Lawrence from the University of Louisville. And we applied this to Yersinia pestis. And we've identified the new Sync Siderophore transporter, which I believe is the first in, in like the last 30 years, which is so it, that's really amazing. 
and, and we're putting this right now into a new manuscript. Now, the cool thing is that you can do many more things with these droplets, right? For instance, you can encapsulate bacteria in a droplet and then re-encapsulate the entire droplet, thereby creating a second layer um, uh, of, of a droplet, basically. And, and we're using these to study cell-cell signaling between bacteria. And another thing that we've done with, together with Ralph Isberg's lab at Tufts, we developed microfluidics that encapsulate bacteria in hydrogel droplets. And then we let these bacteria develop into micro colonies and then let them interact with neutrophils and or macrophages to show that there are non-contact dependent interactions between these cells, which actually mimics what occurs in, in deep, tissue, uh, deep tissue in vivo. Now, sadly enough, TNC has many more weaknesses, not, not many more weaknesses, but, but let's say there's a couple more weaknesses which is that you can't really make these networks that I wanted to make in the first place in high throughput. You can make them, but, but it, you, know, you, you first need to make, you need to screen for double mutants, which you can do with TNC, but, it, but it's very slow basically. And second, you can't really include essential genes because they don't accept transposon insertion. The, mo the moment you get a transposon insertion in, in an essential gene, the bacterium is basically dead, right? Now to overcome these issues, we're developing several new tools. One, one example is a combination of CRISPR-I and TNC, where we screen for genetic interactions between essential genes and the rest of the genome. And, and so this is a, a tool we've set up now, and this is working really well. And, and we believe that a manuscript should be done uh, in a couple of weeks. And that's my optimism as a PI. The second and third tools basically that are under development score uh, genome-wide genetic interactions. And one approach uses two transposons to score all non-essential genetic interactions. And the other tool that we're building uses two guide RNAs to simultaneously score all genetic interactions between all genes. And we have a, a pilot screen that we've done for 300,000 interactions and, and, and that worked really well. So I think that these tools with their validations should also be done in the next uh, six months or so. Okay, so tools are important, right? But, but how do they contribute toward our overarching goals? And for that, I'm going to switch topics, which is where we explore the value of determining how evolution drives the emergence of antibiotic resistance. Now, of course, one of the major challenges in infectious diseases is the rapid rise in dissemination of antimicrobial resistance. Now, each year, there are over 2 million resistance cases in the US alone. And instrumental in this development of resistance seems to be a bacterium's inherent ability to survive low level exposure to antibiotics, which basically gives a population the opportunity to accumulate genomic changes, which can gradually lead to full clinical resistance. Now, diverse mechanisms can lead to antimicrobial resistance. However, clinical strains isolated during antibiotic treatment failure often contain multiple changes distributed across genetic regions that have no clear role in resistance. Now, the majority of antibiotic treatment failure cases thereby remain unexplained. Now, this could simply be because the distribution of changes that can affect a bacterium's drug sensitivity is unknown. Now, to develop a comprehensive understanding of how bacterial pathogens deal with antibiotic pressure, under which circumstances resistance evolves and how the host environment can affect this process, we basically designed a large scale multi-year project for which we formed the center of expertise on the systems biology of antimicrobial resistance. And this was funded by the NIH several years ago. And, my, and my, my lab here at BC manages the work that gets done in our center, which also includes work from the labs of Dr. Jason Ross at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, uh, Ralph Isberg at Tufts Medical School, Van Cooper at the University of Pittsburgh and Jose Bento at Boston College. Now, Key experiment performed within this project involves mapping the spectrum of antibiotic resistant mutations that occur in two different species while adapting to 20 different antibiotics. Now, those two different species are Streptococcus pneumoniae and Acinetobacter baumanniae, so gram positive and a gram negative bacterium. And to determine how the environment and bacterial lifestyle affect mutational fitness profiles, experiments are performed in vitro in planktonic and biofilm lifestyles but we also perform these experiments in vivo. I'll get back to the in vivo in a couple of slides from now. Now, 
in vitro, these bacteria are basically exposed to antibiotics and they are continually passaged about 15 to 30 times while enduring increasing antibiotic concentrations. And we perform, and we also perform phenotypic and population level sequencing for each passage, which basically up till now has resulted in, in thousands of samples basically. So, so what do we see, right? When we do these experiments now in vitro during selection under a planktonic lifestyle, mostly selects for on target mutations that are associated with high level resistance, such as here in this example in DNA replication components, when the bacterium is exposed to uh, uh, cyprofloxacin, which is a DNA synthesis inhibitor. So what we see is that mutations arise in, in genes such as gyrase and topoisomerase, and that's exactly what you would expect, because that's the target of a an antibiotic like cyprofloxacin. Now, in contrast, when you do these experiments in biofilm, um, this, con this condition selects for the simultaneous coexistence of many mutations in a population. But even here, often a clear pattern will emerge of on-target mutations. However, overall, as you, can, as you can see in this bottom right figure here, overall diversity remains much higher. Right? So there's many more mutants and strains that can coexist at the same time. However, this all leads to emergence of resistance and consequently in an increase in MICs of these populations, that minimum inhibitory concentration that an antibiotic, basically uh, uh, the level of antibiotics that stops growth, which means that actively grow under much higher concentrations of antibiotics, right? So that's what these strains can do grow under a very high concentration of antibiotics. But really, what, what the key question here is, what happens in vivo? So selection experiments in vivo are performed in healthy and in immunocompromised mice in the presence of 20 different antibiotics. And in this case, mice are infected, treated with antibiotics after six hours post-infection, and after 24 hours, bacteria are harvested and then passaged to the next mouse. And this is then repeated up to 30 times. and then. This is done in healthy mice and immunocompromised mice and immunocompromised mice are mice that are depleted either for neutrophils or for macrophages. So these are really quite difficult and, and also very laborious experiments. Now, when we look at the data here in vivo, also in vivo, at least initially, selection gave a response, the results you might expect. So for instance, evolving uh, acinetobacter baumannii in the presence of ciprofloxacin in healthy mice, which are the black lines here in this graph, gradually selects for increasing resistance with mutations in the DNA replication machinery, as well as efflux pumps. And efflux pumps are used to basically pump out the antibiotic from the bacterium to lower the, uh, the concentration of antibiotics on the inside of the cell. Now, in neutrophil depleted mice, which are the red lines, selection is characterized by reduced bacterial control Right, resulting in generally higher bacterial loads, leading to resistance at a rate about twice as fast, which really underscores the importance of an intact immune system. Now, in many of our experiments, of these in vivo experiments, selection under in vivo condition, conditions also seem to result in resistance. For instance, adaptation to meropenem in vivo. So meropenem is a cell wall synthesis inhibitor. Um, and, and in vivo in healthy mice, mice enabled us to increase the antibiotic concentration over tenfold within 15 passages, as you can see here, from 10 micro, uh, milligrams per kilogram to 100 milligrams. Now, in clinical treatment, this would be categorized as antibiotic treatment failure, as well as suggesting that the infection had become resistant. So resistance means that the MIC has increased and that bacteria can actively grow while experiencing high concentrations of antibiotics. However, when we measured the MIC of the, these different passages of most of our, of our in vivo experiments, which is um, uh, of these in vivo experiments, right? Instead of observing a gradual increase of resistance over time, like indicated by the blue line here, this is what we would have expected we found no changes in MIC um, uh, in, these, in these populations, which was completely counterintuitive to our expectations. And it also means that these populations are not resistant. Moreover, when we sequenced the populations, what we expected to see were mutations being swept to fixation or high frequency, like this figure here. 
where the population basically becomes dominated by a single strain. However, no fixed or high frequency on-target mutations were or are observed uh, in our populations. Instead, what we find are many mutations coexisting at low frequencies in the population. And actually, after analyzing more and more of these in vivo antibiotic adaptation experiments, we found similar results in many of our in vivo experiments. Thus, even though the infection experiments were constantly leading to antibiotic treatment failure in these mice, when the MIC of the bacterial populations were tested, they showed they had remained antibiotic sensitive. So what's going on here, right? Now, it turns out that instead of resistance, the primary mechanism underlying these instances of antibiotic treatment failure is actually tolerance, which is a phenotype that makes these populations somehow really good at tolerating high antibiotic concentrations. And what you need to know or remember from drugs like antibiotics is that they work really well when the cells are actively growing because they latch on, these antibiotics latch on to active mechanisms and they interfere with them. But if there's no or very little growth, antibiotics often don't work very well because they have nothing to latch on to, right? So tolerance is what we find when we expose these bacteria to very high antibiotic concentrations. While they don't grow under these conditions, they are actually really good at surviving. And that's what this graph at the top right shows, that after several passages, we find these cells that can tolerate antibiotics at a very high concentration very well. Now, does while in vitro selection, like I just showed you a couple of slides ago, with gradual antibiotic increase quickly leads to resistance, which is this graph here on the left, left during our repeated infection of mice, tolerant bacterial populations are selected for that are not resistant, but still under, undergo antibiotic treatment failure because they are good at waiting it out. Basically, they are just sitting there until the environment changes for the better. And we now believe that this phenotype so readily arises because in vivo, the antibiotic concentration can fluctuate drastically based on the PKPD properties of the drug, resulting in very variable antibiotic exposure. So we may be able to create high concentrations that exceed 10 times the MIC, but these concentrations cannot be maintained and thereby creating the opportunity for tolerant or persistent phenotypes to arise. And actually, indeed, we can actually recreate the selection for tolerant phenotypes in vitro as well by in vitro passaging, by doing these in vitro passages with fluctuating antibiotic exposure. And we find that after just three passages, we can selectively enrich for a high proportion of tolerant phenotypes that would lead to treatment failure, but not due to resistance. Okay, so why is this important, right? Well, for bacterial pneumonias caused by pathogens, including strep pneumo, staph, pseudomonas, acinetobacter, klebsiella, antibiotic treatment failure can occur in upwards of 70% of patients. Importantly, perceived clinical failure is actually the leading cause of discontinuing initial antibiotic treatment, more so than actual isolation of a drug-resistant pathogen. So tolerance could thus be a key driving phenotype in antibiotic treatment failure. However, the problem is, is that current diagnostics that are being performed are not designed to identify these tolerant population, populations. Now, tolerance is actually not a new phenomenon. Its existence was actually recognized not long after the discovery of antibiotics. However, the identification of general mechanisms or general genetic mechanisms that drive cells into a tolerant state really remained elusive, right? So what we tried to do in an attempt to get a better understanding of the mechanisms underlying tolerance, we turned to T and seek experiments, which we had actually already performed as part of this project in the presence of 20, and 20 antibiotics and in different strains and species. And the initial reason for doing these experiments was to learn more about the genes and pathways that are involved in overcoming antibiotic stress. However, by performing a new analysis that we came up with, we uncovered something that, that is called the tolerome, which are a set of genes and pathways that are specifically involved in increased tolerance induction. So these genes thereby highlight a multitude of pathways that when altered can rapidly lead to increased tolerance in the population in an antibiotic dependent manner, right? So for instance, mutating this gene here increases survival by approximately 80 fold after 24 hours. 
Now, intriguingly, in the treatment of different types of cancer, right, something completely different, highly similar tolerance-driven treatment failures occur as well. So these tolerant cancer cells tend to behave and respond differently to stress, and they possess distinct collateral drug sensitivities. This suggests basically that the potential for detection and targeted therapeutic interventions against these cells, and that is actually what is happening in, in lots of cancer research right now. And the funny thing is, some of our tolerant phenotypes, well, it's not that funny, but it's interesting. Some of our tolerant phenotypes are also collaterally hypersensitive to other antibiotics. And they respond to antibiotic, to different antibiotics uh, uh, in a different manner as well, well. So while they may be tolerant to one antibiotic, they may be hypersensitive to others. Now, the implications of these findings are thereby at least threefold. First, right, if, you, if tolerance can be identified early on in an infection, it could be used to adjust treatment to avoid treatment failure. Second, their differential response to stress makes them identifiable and trackable. And third, their collateral sensitivities makes them specifically targetable. And these are basically all ideas that were currently being pursued in the lab. Now, infections are not just influenced by drugs. And I'm probably not telling you anything new when I say that the host has a super important role to play. Now, infections are driven by complex host pathogen interactions, right? That can be at least partially characterized by a critical balance that exists between the host defense, tissue integrity, and that's all basically aimed at achieving pathogen control. Ultimately, if this balance is not properly maintained, the infection may escape control and we need to start some kind of treatment. Now, Determining when, whether, and how to interfere are actually not straightforward questions. In infectious diseases, novel diagnostics are mostly focused on pathogen identification, which is really important. However, with the emergence of new experimental and computational tools, opportunities are arising to achieve a much deeper and integrated understanding of how pathogens interact with drugs, their environment, and the host. We believe that such an understanding could actually trigger the development of a new kind of diagnostics, one that predicts whether an infection will likely progress towards disease or resistance and require specific treatment. However, it is not clear whether such predictions are actually possible and what information they would require. Now, to solve this challenge, right, or in other words, if we want to predict the outcome of an infection, we borrowed from the philosophy that in order to predict a system's outcome, you need to understand how it responds to disturbances in its environment. For instance, how does it deal with certain challenges? How does it overcome these challenges, right? And where are the boundaries of these challenges? And is there a moment where it all breaks down? So if you can follow the response of that system and you can put that response into some kind of context, so if you can capture and represent it in some kind of simplified way, and you can link it to an outcome, then you can potentially use this information to make predictions. So that's what we're attempting. We try to capture as much as possible of a response, then simplify and represent it in order to make generalizable predictions on the outcome. Okay, from robots back to bacteria. So it is generally assumed that in order to overcome a stress, bacteria activate a specific response, right? But what can we actually say about a stress response? If you follow a stress response over time, many things change. And in microbiology, we, we've built these beautiful constructs such as the SOS response in response to DNA damage or the stringent response in response to nutrient starvation. So this means that the trans transcriptional profiles of certain genes can say something about the stress the organism is ex experiencing. And this idea has led to the assembly of gene panels that can predict whether, for instance, E. coli is resistant to a certain antibiotic. Now, this could be diagnostically very handy because it means you expose a bacterium to, let's say, ciprofloxacin for an hour, and based on the expression profile of a small number of genes, you can predict whether it, whether it is resistant to that antibiotic concentration or not. However, we found and I'll show you that in a second, that such models are not generalizable, but highly specific for a species and antibiotic. And thus, we wondered whether we can, is there a way to capture a response in a different, mean, meaningful way 
to make predictions on antibiotic resistance independent of strain, species, or the antibiotic we're looking at. Now for this, we created a detailed temporal RNA-seq data set for two as pneumonia strains responding to 25 different types of stress, including 20 antibiotics. Additionally, we took all of these wild type strains that we had and we adapted them to different antibiotics. Then we took the adapted strains, sequenced them, and again exposed them to drugs and, and, and different nutrients to see how their transcriptional profiles had changed and, and, and how their responses had changed. So the goal was basically to see whether we could select one specific gene panel that could predict antibiotic resistance or sensitivity for any antibiotic. And for this, we build a model. Um, uh, we, we basically build a, kind of like a traditional model. Model. We build a model that, that selected an optimized set of 28 genes. So we had the model basically look at the data and select the, the optimal set of, of genes that it could use to make these predictions on, okay? Now, what we found is a model that, that selected 28 genes, and, and we found an accuracy somewhere between 90 and 77 percent of predicting uh, uh, whether a strain is resistant or sensitive. This is okay, but it's not great. And it turns out that this type of gene panel is very sensitive to the data that it is built on, right? So additionally, the genes it uses are not well conserved across species. So that's a problem. And it, it, this actually also goes for another published gene panel, which is here at the bottom, um, uh, which was made for one specific antibiotic. Because if you have bad gene conservation, you cannot make it generalizable for different strains or for different species. Now, the first question that we, that we asked after this, uh, when we got this suboptimal gene panel, is now why can't we select a robust, super strong predictive gene panel that works across many different conditions and strains and species? But to answer this, we next we basically performed a PCA trajectory analysis, which shows that temporal transcriptional responses to drugs within the same mechanism of action tend to follow similar tra trajectories over time. So each mechanism of, of action, cell wall synthesis inhibitors, protein synthesis inhibitors, DNA synthesis inhibitors, they does have a distinct tra transcriptional trajectory. They have their own sort of changes that they follow over time. Now, we also tried to see whether we could use the data to build a, a gene panel for mechanism of action predictions. And this resulted in 34 genes um, um, in, in basically a model of 34 genes. Because by looking at the expression profile of these genes, right, we can now predict what the mechanism is of action is of a drug that a specific bacterium like strep pneumo is exposed to. And this works really well where we get an overall accuracy of 96%. So really pretty good. However, these distinct trajectories that you see at the, in, this, in this top graph suggest basically show and suggest that there's a lack in overlap between these responses. Basically, these responses never really converge anywhere. And, and that's kind of a problem for us. So while these, this, this really enables predicting mechanisms of action really well, and we're not the first to show that, um, it prevents the formation of a single model that can make generalizable, generalizable antibiotic resistance predictions. Okay, so can't we find something that is common among all bacteria and basically indicates the state the organism is in, okay? And whether it's thriving or not in its environment. So this question actually recalled an observation we published on a couple of years ago, where we showed that there are very clear and consistent patterns in the way an organism responds to a known environment or an environment that it is adapted to but that these patterns fall apart and become disorganized when it is confronted with a new environment it is not adapted to. So this finding was really an important hint that suggested to us that with increasing stress, an organism may be confronted with increasing disorganization or chaos. Right? Now, if you like me, like science fiction, you may know this novel in the Star Trek universe. Uh, which is appropriately called the entropy effect. Now, this of course has lots of drama with Kirk and Spock, but the core of the story is that 
for some unknown reason, the increase in entropy in the universe has begun to accelerate. And this will result in the end of the universe in a few decades. So, yeah, it will end all well, right? So, so but the increase in entropy or chaos is basically in this novel an omen for the end of the universe. And we figured that an increase in transcriptional chaos could also be the key in our story. So we actually implemented entropy as a bi biological concept, concept to quantify stress. Now entropy is a specific measure of randomness. And it is really important to understand that here it doesn't just come from changes in transcription, but it comes from large irregular changes in transcription. Like in the high example here on the right side of this slide. Now it turns out that these changes that these, that these random or, or very erratic changes get triggered due to a loss of regulatory gene dependencies in the genome, which, which pushes the regulation of the genome into an unstable state. Now with entropy at the core, we train the suite of predictive models and there's at least two ways to calculate transcriptional entropy. You can calculate it over a time series, which gives a real clear picture of how it develops over time. And within 60 to 90 minutes of exposure to an antibiotic, we can predict by the amount of chaos that develops, whether an organism survives in its environment and is resistant or not. However, you can also calculate it from a single time point. And while a single time point is a little less sensitive, it still gives a really good accuracy of at least 90%. Okay, so these predictions work pretty well across many different environments, nutrient environments, antibiotic environments, anything that we throw at it. But can we simply carry it over to different species? Because the way we developed this model was just based on strep pneumo data. Now to assess this, we, we tested seven additional strains and species. And these were all exposed to the same concentration of ciprofloxacin, just another antibiotic. And when we measure the amount of transcriptional entropy, um, which indeed exactly predicts whether the species is sensitive or resistant to the, to the tested antibiotic concentration. Now remember, these strains in this slide and species were not used in model construction. And thus these predictions are completely independent from the way the model was built. But there's something neat, we observed something else. Now it looked like the severity of the chaos, right, seems to inversely cor correlate with the sensitivity of the bacterium to the drug. Meaning the more sensitive the strain, the more entropic or chaotic the response. While the most resistant strains have the least dramatic response or the least entropy. Now this suggests that entropy may be able to say more than just whether a bacterium is sensitive or resistant to an antibiotic. And indeed, it turns out that the level of entropy can be used to accurately quantify the exact level of resistance of a bacterium. And to show this, we build a model that translates entropy into a bacterium's MIC. And to test this, we measured the entropy in two strains of Acinetobacter baumannii, a species that was not used in building the model. And then when we tried to fit the entropy level to the MIC, which basically resulted in an exact prediction, uh, which are the green circles of each strain's actual level of resistance, which are the yellow circles. So this is really cool. Right? Because we now have a single feature that can represent the state the organism is in and predict whether it will thrive or not in an environment that it finds itself in. Now, it turns out that these models can actually be further improved to 100% to accuracy with integration of more data. And additionally, we are using entropy as a fundamental building block to make models on prediction on the presence of tolerance phenotypes, predictions on adaptive evolution, and analyzing host pathogen interaction networks to predict disease outcome and progression in vivo. But I don't have time to go into that. And it's all yeah, under construction, let's say, right now in the lab. Okay, so the last topic I will briefly touch upon is our work on diagnostics development. So this project started simultaneously on several fronts. Um, so with, with Jean Ming Gao's group at Chemistry here at DC, we have focused on the development of a phage library-based screen that incorporates non-natural amino acids in this screen that can bind lipids on a bacterial surface with very high specificity. Now, screening with these chemically enhanced libraries 
has resulted in super specific probes that bind specific bacterial pathogens. Now, all we need for this to screen, for, for this to work in the screen, is some service modification that distinguishes one strain or species from another to basically select for a new peptide. Now, an example of such a peptide is, is a peptide we call CAM5, which specifically recognizes Staph aureus, and which can, for instance, be used to deliver a cytotoxin payload to Staph, and which very high specificity only kill that bacterium in like a mixed population. Now, simultaneously, so we have these very specific peptides that we can, that we can basically screen for, right? And they're very small. They're only like about um, a couple of uh, amino acids large, like, like 10 or 15. Now, simultaneously with the Birch Lab uh, at physics here at Boston College, we started talking about the idea of developing small devices that could very rapidly identify an infection and determine the presence of a resistant pathogen. So Ken, Ken Birch uh, works on graphene and thus it basically didn't take very long for us to come up with the idea to develop graphene-based devices that can detect bacteria in a very small sample basically with the goal to simplify and speed up detection of infectious disease species and or resistant strains. So we started building these small devices, you can see here in the inset next to the Apple pen, that fit on the tip of your finger. So th they're really very small. And these devices are built in our, in our clean room and consist of a layer of silicon on which we place graphene. And graphene is a 2D material. It's basically a single atom thick that can highly efficiently conduct charge and act like a gate. So these devices are highly sensitive to any chemical or biological modification, and they have very fast responses, uh, response times, and 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 very much uh, a lot of flexibility to different substrates. So something like a biological particle can charge the graphene and p-dope it. So that's what you see here on the right in this graph. Now in our devices, we wire up the graphene with gold contacts which basically allows us to measure any charge changes and thereby basically generating a very small sensing device that in reality is no thicker than a hair. Now we first tested our devices by allowing the absorption of E. coli on the surface of the graphene, just bare graphene. And as a resistance versus voltage graph, um, oh, I went, I went one too far, that's okay. Um, and, and as the resistance versus voltage graph shows, we can detect the bacteria charge surface as a shift in the direct voltage, right? So you see that the, the bare graphene gives you the black line. And when we throw some uh, uh, E. coli just on the surface, we get a shift. And that basically means the device is charged up. So it, it, it detects that there's something there, right? It, it registers the bacterium sitting on the surface. But, but this is not specific, right? We just throw on some E. coli. So we need something to make the graphene surface and charging specific, which is where the peptides that we just developed with Xiaoming Gauss lab uh, come in. Now, our peptide probes can be easily conjugated with a pyrene linker and integrated onto the device in a single step. And, and you can do that. And but that basically works like something like a pi-pi stacking interaction. So it's, it's a stack, basically. The probe just sits on the graphene and attaches itself. OK, so, so we think that by adding these probes, we can make it specific. So now for some measurements. Um, so this is what the, 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 the device basically looks for, bare graphene that I, that I just showed you. Clean peak, this is our baseline. Now, when we functionalize it by adding probes, there's no change, which is good. You don't want to have a change because you're basically adding probes. We're not detecting anything. OK, um, now we're going to add some bacteria. First, when we challenge with B. subtilis, gram-positive species, the peak stays the same, meaning there's no change in charge of the device, which is good because the probe that we used here is specific for staph. It's the CAM5 that I showed you a couple of slides ago. Okay, so next now we add staph to the device. And finally, we observe a shift indicating that the device is getting charged and it's basically being very specific or it's specific to staph. And this is exact, this is great, right? This is what we wanted. So interestingly, we can actually image the device and count how many staff are bound to the device, which shows that we can register the capture of a single bacterial cell by our probes, which is enough to charge the device and shift the peak. And furthermore, the amount of change is indicative of the number of bacteria that are caught by the probes. Okay, very cool. Single cell detection, right? However, there's a small issue. 
even though we can measure the attachment of a single bacterium, we need about a concentration of 10 to the seven CUUs per mil in the sample we add to the device. So this is not super sensitive at all. Now, that this may sound a little bit counterintuitive, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain how that works. Right? Now we hypothesize that we need so many bacteria because it's all a probability game. Basically, cells are floating in the liquid and they need to hit the probes on the surface which are all relatively far away. And when we lower the concentration, the probability that this happens very quickly becomes more improbable. So basically, how do we make this quicker and more probable? Well, we thought we could take advantage of the charged bacterial services yet again and figure that by applying gate pulses, I'll tell you what that means, we could rapidly drive the bacteria to the surface of the device and promote quicker capture. And indeed, this works incredibly well. Not only increases this sensitivity by a thousandfold, it also makes the measurements possible within five minutes of adding the sample. So basically just by shocking the bacteria from the top, uh, you, you drive them to the bottom of the device and they can latch on or the probes latch onto the bacteria. The charge is distributed to the, the graphene and that's what we detect. And this is actually what we found for all of the probes and bacteria that we tested so far. Now, currently what we're doing is where we are developing new, uh, uh, new approaches to select for more diverse and different probes, including aptamers. And we're also redesigning the device to enable multiplex testing of 24 different targets simultaneously. And also integration with microfluidics for faster and more efficient testing. Okay, so that's what we're doing with it. Now in the last, 47 minutes, I think it was. I tried to give you a bit of a flavor of the work that we do, why we do it, and why I think it is so important to take an integrated approach and incorporate ideas and viewpoints from all kinds of different fields, not only because I think this is a great way to solve complex problems, but also because I think it's really fun and exciting to, to collaborate with a lot of different people and learn all kinds of different and new things. Now, in relation to this special Tsujimoto lecture, and to close out, I want to give a piece of advice to the undergrads, grad students, and postdocs in the audience about success and what I think is important when you are considering what career to pursue. So I personally find it very important to remind myself that there is no obvious pathway that leads to success. And what does it mean to have success anyway? Right? You may see all kinds of people around you and or on social media that publish amazing articles in the highest impact journals, which is a measure of success in academia, I guess. But when you see this happen, it is important to realize that most often this has not come easily. There's a lot of luck involved and a lot of failure as well. Now, for my career, the development of TNC has been very important and resulted in some measure of success. And if you look at it, if you look at the, the technique, it looks very simple quite straightforward and it must have been easy, but it wasn't. There were many times I thought about giving up on it and in the end, it almost didn't even get published. Now, these types of doubts and failures, I think continue till, till today. And it is important to realize that most normal people don't just have success all the time. Instead, they have many more failures and misfirings than success. And thus comparing yourself to others with seemingly lots of success is not a measure you want to take. It is a great recipe for feeling miserable, right? So that is why it is so important to intrinsically enjoy what you are doing. And if you realize today that most of the, the time you are not enjoying it, and I say most of the time, right? I don't think it's possible to enjoy it all, all of the time. But if it's most of the time you don't like it, then you need to do something about it now and not later when you're a grad student or a postdoc or a PI or whatever. Uh, lastly, you may have doubts about what you want to do or become. Since I was a grad student, I wanted to have my own lab. But before that, I wanted all kinds of other things. And today, I don't even know how long I will keep doing this. And there's a very realistic probability that in several years from now, I will be doing something completely different. Or maybe not. I just don't know, right? I'll see what happens. And at least as long as I really like it most of the time. For me, this mindset has been a really important realization that didn't always come naturally. And it doesn't always come automatically, but by collaborating with a diverse group of people, working on a variety of topics and doing all kinds of different things like writing books or climbing or skiing makes me conscious of that I'm not just one thing, that there's not just one thing that defines me 
And that if the work in the lab isn't going the way I wanted to or hoped for, that there are still many other things I do that are enjoyable and exciting at that moment. So this means enjoy what you do, right? You don't have to have one thing that defines you. There are so many other things and careers outside of academia and research that are cool and exciting. And you simply need to reach out to as many people as you can to explore those ideas and your passions and let that drive you. Okay, that's enough from, from, from uh, Grandpa Tim, I think. Uh, most importantly, these are most of the people in my lab right now uh, um, uh, here on the left. Uh, our collaborators, um, uh, our undergrads right now, which is uh, very much reduced, and our uh, uh, funding agencies that, that pay for all this wonderful work that we do. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, wow, that was really powerful. Thanks for sharing. Um, oh my God, the little puppy. Um, yeah, if, if everyone or if anyone has any questions, please feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, again, this meeting is recorded. So if you need to throw it in the chat and then leave to your next engagement, you can watch the recording and see the answer, or you could, um, join us tomorrow where Tim is meeting with faculty and grad students and postdocs in separate meetings. Um, there's a sign up for that. I'll resend the email, but feel free to ask there as well. Um, do we have any questions? You can either put it in the chat or unmute yourself. I guess mine since you ended on more of a career note, um, I wanted to ask like, if you're, if you're coming from this place that has a bunch of like Amsterdam, like a geographical location that has, you know, a bunch of outdoor activities and it's a little more like community based than, you know, some cities in America, how did you go from like being a champion skier and sailor to wanting to be in a lab. <laughs> it's, they seem like very different worlds. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, I, I, Christina, I don't know. I mean, um, <laughs> uh, you know, like I said, I, I think we all have all kinds of different things that we like, right? And that we enjoy. And, and I think it's important to try to do a lot of different things. And, and I find that very exciting. So, so that's what I've always done. And, um, and um, yeah, you know, and for instance, when we were sailing, I, we practiced a lot as well um, on the weekends and, and through the winter. And, and this was all done with one of my best friends who was also doing his PhD. And, you know, so we're all, we're all in the same boat and we know that we, we have to work really hard as a grad student, right? But there's also time to do, to do fun stuff. So, you know, pick, take that time. And, and it's also so important to uh, take that time because it charges you up to do, to work hard when you're in the lab. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, uh, I guess it's a matter of planning. And, and it's so easy to just be in the lab all the time, but I think it's actually much more efficient if you, if you have other stuff as well that you wanna do, and then, you, then you're forced to plan all that stuff in and make sure that you can still do all the research that you wanna do. So I think that, that's always been, um, I think, an important thing. Yeah. Also, what I, I try I to tell my that. own students always, that they need to go do something outside of the lab and not just be in the lab all the time. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I know I'm speaking for a lot of grad students here, and this might not be like the monolith of our experience, but definitely like balancing our value in lab versus out of lab, like due to shelter in place, like us not being able to be in lab all the time has definitely like shaken us a little bit. So I think you're, your advice and uh, your talk at the end there was very much needed and hit home, at least for me. <laughs> um, we've, <laughs> we've got a question uh, in the chat. Thanks for the interesting talk. This is from Zach, he's in Kim's lab. Has there been any work to look at in vivo resistance development in different microbiome contexts? 
would you expect community interactions or horizontal gene transfer to affect routes to tolerance or resistance? Yeah, well, yeah, so definitely. Um, so so we, we are not working on that because we that's too difficult for us um, to also consider the uh, microbiome, you know, and it, it just becomes too complex. So I, I like to ignore it. Um, no. There are some, I, I know of some other groups that are, that are doing that and, and definitely super important. Um, but you know, it's like, like when you do an experiment, you, 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 need to, uh, you need to work on a system that is manageable and that can get you uh, answers. Um, and at one point, you know, we'll definitely get to adding the microbiome in the mix. But it, uh, for, for us, it's just not where we are yet. You know, it's, it's basically too difficult to also integrate that part, right? And to still understand what's going on, so. Awesome, okay. Well, we are 10 minutes past and I wanna make sure we respect everyone's time. So I think we'll go ahead and end it there. Again, if you have any remaining questions that you'd like to ask, um, please do come to the meetings with him tomorrow. I'm sure you'd be happy to answer them all there. Um, but otherwise, let's, Give him one more virtual round of applause before we before we break. Thanks, Christine. Awesome. No problem. Thank you so much for coming. Very glad that we brought you. <laughs> okay. Have a good one, everyone. <laughs>